Well, I guess part two, again, uh, continuing to try to understand uh, the letter that was sent over to Bo, the fifth column, from a supposed college student. Question was raised. Why was the UN weak? Well, why is the UN weak? Again, no research. This is what I got to think against college students when they don't do their damn homework, and they got to depend upon an internet guy for it. I'm really pissed off about these guys because they don't know their ass from hot rock. Why is the UN weak and not able to do anything? Again, whatever happened to the League of Nations before World War II? Did anybody remember what happened to the League of Nations prior to that? And what happened prior to World War I? That got us into a shooting war that damaged a country's economy that came back and bite people in the ass after that, decades later. We had a League of Nations for the countries to mutually cooperate with each other, try to find mutual interests, trying to keep a stability in the world. That's what the League of Nations was supposed to be. But we lost that, especially when the countries that got misaligned and got into a war situation. It became almost a chief bad guy here. And in the formation of it, created a little guy with a... Well, how would you call this schmuck in the first place? Who used political influence on people to create genocidal feelings towards a race, towards a thinking, towards a creed, towards something. Something that would get his ego fed up and fired up. Kind of reminds me of something we got right now anyway in our current policy. This is why I say good policy. I mean, when I was hearing from, from Bo trying to communicate this, he's having a hard time trying to make the dots on this one. Think of it as a spider web we're constantly stuck in. But without the sticky portion of it. Without the monstrous bug ready to come down and kill us. Think of it as everything being interconnected one way or another. Policies, thoughts, decisions. We have this fluidity going on. How is this country going to be affecting us one way or another? In World War I, we had an assassination happen. That chain reacted into what we had several countries fighting each other across the worlds, or actually across the oceans, in different continents different countries that ended up in a stalemate we had an armistice we didn't have the war is ended that's it we have an armistice being uh, written up you will stop you will stop producing weapons this one country you will stop doing this thing otherwise we're coming over here and beating the hell out of you we have enough too much we have too much collateral damage right now as it is we don't want the continuing war one thing you got to understand about war. War brings out creativity in people really negative on how to kill people left and right. Most of the most effective thing to create chaos and confusion is creating their weapons. But do you ever create peace with it? Nope. Create more ways to hate and kill people left and right and be uh, angry at them for decades to come. Civil war was like that in America. Or information? People didn't like it back in the South. They didn't like how the how the uh, Union side was treating and mistreating them, according to what they felt. And of course, the anger and frustration towards certain races of people came out. It took them decades to get it. Reformation to stop. South will have to develop its own style, its own own way. But we really didn't want another repeat of the, of the Civil War. Problem is, the Civil War was not unofficially resolved. It was officially resolved, but not unofficially, because we still had our anger, our hatred, our mistrust, and the misconceptions, and misinformation, and the anger is still there to this day. It's generational. Much like we see on, on Middle East, concerning about the Israelis. 
Palestine, Palestine, Jerusalem been fought over for God knows how long in human history. The idea, the ideal, I mean, a brick and mortar can be replaced, but the ideal city is still there. There are so many things that are connected. And sometimes it's kind of hard to put them in words. Because unless you have the time or perspective and context, you just don't understand it. You have to take it in small chunks before you get the main course down your throat on this one. And by that time, you probably lost your taste buds and your teeth. But concerning about why the United Nations is so weak right now, it's not just troops, because the troops have to come from every participating country. 90s to 2000s, we had Sarajevo, we had the Bosnia and Serbia war going on. We had to have UN troops in there. We also had to have UN troops going through uh, the continent of Africa because a few other countries were trying to kill each other. We had genocide going. Hence, we had to have United Nations troops in there, including representation from the United States in there. But if they wore the banner of the, Un of the United Nations, that means we had several countries supplying the men and the equipment to try to quell disruptance, violence, internal strife that's affecting other countries. The reason why sometimes we're so hesitant in getting people into NATO, it takes a long while. They're still trying to get Ukraine into NATO officially. How long did it take us to get Finland in? And yet we got the Finnish Navy out there, we also got the Finnish troops out there fighting for different causes. And in NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which means about, God knows, about 100 people who made the pledge to say no to communism happening in our countries or actually coming across their borders in the form of Russia and its belligerency. That was just basically a buffer against Russia. That's not United Nations. That's just NATO. But United Nations still... We want things to be a status quo. We don't want the countries fighting each other because we know resources are limited as it is. We know that some countries actually have egomaniac rulers in there and want nothing but death and destruction and chaos and confusion. Hello? History! Good Lord. Bo's got to get into this. He's got to understand it more or else he's got to work on his way of trying to explain things to the people left and right. Okay, next question on Bo, the fifth column, is trying to figure this shit out left and right. The writer pulled out, why isn't every, everyone rolling their eyeballs out at the word just? Okay, can we tear this damn thing apart? According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, we have it as an adjective, we have it as an adverb. No, adjective would be very descriptive, and adverb, well, that's barely like a, a function. So, Adjective. So let's take a look at the synonyms of justice, or actually of just. So, A, having a basis in or conforming to fact or reason. Being reasonable. Uh, example, had just reason to believe he was in danger. Well, did he? Was there any just reason for that one? Okay, conforming to a standard of correctness, proper. Define this one in whose viewpoint. What's proper these days? If we could just follow the rules, and, and we would be happy. We would be this. We're thinking to that particular conclusion at this point. It doesn't work that way. Or faithful to an original. It doesn't work. Or how about trying to be righteous about it? Just and righteous. Acting or being in conformity with or with a uh, reverse. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Acting or being in conformity with what is morally upright or good. Righteous. Viewpoint. Ego. Someone else's viewpoint looking at the damn topic again. Their own viewpoint matters. Everybody else is screwed, right? What is being merited? What is deserved? 
What's legally correct and lawful? Ah, here's the other one. Whose legal definition? And under whose laws are we talking about? International? National? Personal? Are there personal laws? Is my personal law? Do I have personal law here? No. I understand that there's uh, ordinances. There are county uh, laws going on, but things we have to follow. Then there's state laws, rules, regulations. Much like the uh, county in, in this town. And then there's federal law, rules, and regulations. And codes of justice. Okay. So one country's version, one country's viewpoint, is supposed to say that this is what we think is good and moral. Okay, try this one. You have a country that's already been taken over for decades. And you happen to go into the country and you take pictures. You're going to have people screaming and yelling at you. You cannot do that. But why? I'm only taking pictures. What's wrong with that? Oh! It is wrong! But why? Because we made rules and regulations telling, saying that you cannot take a picture of this particular landscape or this particular item over here. Send them to the gallows! We'll talk about his execution later. But what did I do? I just took a picture. You took a picture inside your hotel room at a bar of soap? That's illegal. You can't arrest me for that. That's not justice. That's the rules and regulations, pal. And next, we're going to bust your fingers because we feel like it. No, that's because the rules and regulations says that we have to put you on a mock trial and then bust your fingers. Or how about if you happen to go into a country and you're doing photojournalism in there? We'll get back to the camera. We'll do the same camera thing. Only this time, you're taking pictures of the people. Then you hear uh, the police coming out saying, you can't do that. Why? Because you're taking pictures of the people. Well, they take pictures of themselves. They are allowed. They are citizens. You are not. You are a foreign trespass. I got a visa. I got paperwork that allowed me into your country. Revoked. Now, with us, to the gulag. But I had no trial. This was your trial. Insane, but this is what we deal with. Countries that have their different policies. Foreign policy, here we go. But you're also saying, what's justice? What's just? The uh, adjective again. Acting or being in conformity with what is morally upright or good. Sometimes morally and upright can be translated as it under a law, under a guideline. Let's go guideline. What's the law says? If I happen to go into a country with a different dress code other than the one I'm supposed to have, would I be considered just and righteous by wearing that? Because I have a mantle of being an American. Or consider this one. Roman Empire. Roman Empire. If you're not part of Rome, then you're screwed. If you're not of the Roman Empire, you're screwed. If you are a slave, you're screwed. How are you enslaved? Because you were constricted, consigned, and stripped of the human dignity and human rights. And you're told, because if not, you're going to die. Here's the point of the sword. Now, conform, comply, or die. That's just. That's Roman Empire just. Look at the adverb. Just, or they call it gist, or jest, also without. Uh, exactly, precisely, just right. Just right on the coffee level here. The amount of coffee, the amount of cream, and the amount of sugar is just right. Which means it's exactly, pre precisely. Or, how about this one? By a very large, actually by a very small margin, barely. Barely in time to get my coffee pot off the, t off the stove top 
without it bubbling over and losing a lot of precious water. Happens to me all the time. Or just west of there, just immediately, directly, exactly. Okay. Uh, just a few paces from me is the stove with a pot of hot water. It's just a few paces from here. Only and simply is another one. Just last year, or just be yourself. Just, just be this way because we can't accept anything else beyond the parameters. No, no, no. It has to be narrow. It has to be precise. It has to be this viewpoint. You cannot go beyond that. It's just not happening. Why are you doing this? You're going against the program. I can't deal with it. No. Talk about your Karen moments. See, I'm just doing it for the English. I am doing this as if you're in an English class and you have to explain it to the students what the hell is going on, why these words were happening. I mean, this could have been addressed K through 12, but now got the college professors trying to explain this to the delinquents that keep going in there and keep testing. The problem is that some of the college courses we've got over here, they're trying to phase out all the beginning all the testing has to be done with these smaller units instead of a larger class to educate the masses. The college professors are getting a little sick and tired of it sometimes. I've heard the grumblings. I've heard the gripings throughout my life, I mean, uh, throughout my tenure going over to college, over to community college. It's one thing seeing the adults like 40 or 50 years old cry, trying to get their education, but they prefer, let me see if I can get this rephrased, possibly because some adults have never graduated from either junior high or high school. But they have a way of understanding things that made them get through life. But in order to get certain uh, jobs or skill sets or careers that they want to go for, they need the collegiate. They need the academic road. Of course, technically, not... Uh, you know, going to technical schools to learn um, skill sets. That's one thing. But you still have to have a GED because in order to get those skill sets, you need to understand what you're looking at. And without those skill sets, it's damn near difficult and nearly impossible to deal with collegiate work without those skill sets. No wonder the professors are having conniption fits every single semester I go into them. So regarding just why people roll their eyes, well, I'm just giving you English descriptions about that one there. All right, Bo, you did a tap dance on the uh, PLO, uh, PLO Palestine, uh, Palestine Liberation Authority. Or organization at one time they were called. Remember Yasser Arafat back in the 80s and 90s? What kind of a terrorist we thought he was? Because he wanted more direct control, but he also wanted Israel to back off. They wanted to be a little bit more independent. But also, they wanted Israel out of their country. But we had to work with Yasser Arafat to a point. It wasn't easy for the Israeli people to work with this guy because he was a known terrorist to a lot of people. So Israel looked at the Palestinians as second-class citizens to them. Yeah, I keep forgetting history at this point. That country's been fought over like crazy left and right. Depends on which particular government system's owning it. But the United Nations steps in about 1948 and tears apart the country into chunks and making Israel home. And then it's up to the, the administration subsequent afterwards, and not to mention the foreign bodies that were overseeing and governing it by their own rules and regulations. So one of the Middle Easterns couldn't trust the Westerns because we wanted things our way. And I'm also talking about Great Britain as well. They had their shot, and they lost their shot when the Israel was formed. But then you had the PLO organizing... People wanted to be independent. They didn't want anything to deal with Israel. They wanted to live as they wanted to live. But would they understand and agree to a two-state solution? 
Even during the time of Arafat, they didn't even have the two-state solution. They kept talking about it, but they didn't have it. They didn't want the peace. They didn't want the peace. Now we got Hamas. Hamas became the PLO. Hamas became the organization. As much as my limited understanding of the Israeli situation is, and of the Middle East, the Middle East conflict and politics, each country has their own way of, of handling things. Each country has both cultural, historical backings to supplement their decisions, to back up their decisions of how to treat the other Arabs. It goes back generations after generations after generations. As I said before, history, history, history. Because history will tell you, and you have to keep digging into things like this to understand the reasons why. Some of the questions I'm hearing from this college student who's asking, should have been asked in a political science uh, teacher. Should have had at least an hour or maybe 10 or 15 minutes to ask these questions. And they'll say, put it into a form of an essay. Put it into a form of an essay that way I can read. You need your thesis. You need the questions. And then you need to start asking. And you need to start putting them in, into a context that the professor can understand. And then the conclusion at the end of the essay. And then where you got your information from. If you are a student, put it into an essay. Write the damn thing out. Don't start asking the internet for this damn shit. Because even he's not that hip on this kind of situation. You're college students. This is what you're supposed to do. Why? Because this is just the way it's supposed to be. Let me go further on Justin at this point. Comment further. The other question... That popped in. It kind of rattled the bow a little bit on there. Was can the Palestinian people get their land back? This was already established back in 1948 that the displaced Israelis, actually uh, displaced Jews, if I can use that one. I hate being demographic, but you know. World War II decimated a great deal of the Jewish population. It didn't matter which particular country they came from. If they're following, if they're following Judaism, and they were descendant, their lines were being decimated left and right. The family lines were disappearing. Because in World War II, we had one crazy lunatic who wanted to get rid of all the Jews. He wanted to do ethnic cleansing. He wanted to do genocide. He didn't care. Anybody else related to him one way or another, or even seemingly remote, was still going to get killed anyway. He didn't care. He was just crazy. So I'm glad he was killed. Couldn't deal with that nuts anyway in this time and age. But we got his descendants, the people who followed this lunatic's viewpoints, even to this day. We got him out there. Can the Palestinian people get their uh, country back? It would take an act of United Nations to do that again, to reverse it. But since we already have the Jewish nation established already, no. Will there be possibly or potentially a two-state solution? I don't know. Maybe not in this particular administration. Maybe in the next 20 or 30 years, possibly. But we'll see. If we hadn't gone into a nuke storm yet. Hardest question to be asked is how do you how do you look past the genocide in Israel? Fingers are being pointed left and right on who's the actual cause of the whole situation. And sometimes it's just not that easy. Will there be a two state solution? Could there be a two-state solution? 
There's a lot of fears and doubt in this one because there has to be a lot of faith and trust in it. But since you have an administration in, a, in Israel right now who doesn't support it and only supports genocide, I think they're morally right. I'll be addressing this one to Bo and to that student writer. In our lifetimes, we will not see it. In my humble opinion, there is too much anger, there is too much hatred, there is too much generational. There is too much generational anger. It gets worse and worse every 20 or 30, or maybe 40 years. A new generation pops up, and we don't see peace. We see a constant, constant need for people to retaliate. It's like the Old Testament being replayed over and over again, an eye for an eye. And unfortunately, they can't see what peace is all about. They don't want it. If they wanted it, it would have been done a long time ago. It's not being. Because it doesn't matter which side starts to fight. They're both drawn into it. I could blame Hamas for this particular round. I could blame them for this one. But I'm not quite sure if they're going to be totally clean from all of this. Basically, if they're innocent. Since it's in this particular round of violence happening in Israel... Hamas clearly started this shit. But going jumping back into history, who's to blame for all that start? This is what the Middle East constantly does with long term memory of the generational hatred of each other. There's no way to find a peaceful solution to anything. Example it was it back in seventy eight, seventy nine when uh, Israel had the Sinai War? with Egypt, fighting over territory. It took President Jimmy Carter over Camp David to bring in Israel and Egypt's leaders to talk and to get them to sign a peace accord. But as I said before concerning about the generational hatred, Menachem Begin of Egypt Anwar Sadat of Israel, both assassinated by the extreme hatred of the people. Both got killed. It's on a constant nature, it's on a constant basis. There's, I don't know if there's going to be any kind of peace in the Middle East at all. All they know is war. But there is any peaceful times. It's the hardest thing to to hold on to, the most precious thing. Not just freedom, but peace. As for the Palestinian people, it'll be a miracle from God. This is answering before. Bo had a chance to answer the question, so I'm going to take up on this one. Does it make America look weak because they want to get a two-state solution in Israel? Get the ceasefire going? No, not really. This is that before concerning about uh, President Jimmy Carter back in the 70s on this one. This is why I keep saying history, 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 history. Because history is a lot of facts, figures, but also moments in time that actually do build up to this to this point. Consider it like bricks of the road. Whatever kind of rocky terrain we've got. Okay, let me uh, let me do this. The Roman Empire. We thought of a bloodthirsty, but they were also efficient. They were also efficient, efficient at making roads and and bridges and buildings to last as long as they've had for thousands of years or even hundreds of years a lot better than our infrastructure right now currently 
I'm saying it. I'm saying it. Because their roads still matter. Their buildings and bridges still mattered. They have built roads in areas that should not have been roads, but they made it anyway. Human beings can do that. In the roughest terrain, politically, sociologically, or even physically, they can make inroads. They can make the roads through other passes. Okay, try this other one. And this is going to be another histor historical situation. Vietnam War, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a road called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was named after the leader of the North Vietnamese Army, the Communist Party over there, Ho Chi Minh. The United States kept trying to tear this damn thing apart left and right. They wanted to stop the North Koreans, actually not the uh, North Vietnamese, from terrorizing South Vietnam and... They were trying to hold back the communist situation. I mean, it's complicated enough with the Vietnam War. But the thing is, what I was focused on was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a main supply line that went from the north to the south, but also into Cambodia and Laos. And the United States wanted to had tried desperately to tear apart the supply line. But every time they kept bombing it, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, they built it and rebuilt it and rebuilt it and rebuilt it. Endurance. Physical endurance. Something to tell the people that you can knock this thing down so many damn times. We want the inroads. We want our trail. Looking at it in one particular viewpoint here, it's saying that you can say this is not possible, but we're saying it is possible. It's going to continue on and deal with it. As for the inroads concerning about the peace in the Middle East, look at, the, look at either the Vietnam situation or even the Roman Empire, how they tried to build their roads all over the damn place. Of course, with slave labor, but so everybody else can benefit from it, including the slaves that they had to walk the road in the first place. So... In that context, we made those kind of inroads and in, in pathways into the Middle East. I say, still look back at 19, the, the 78 79 situation regarding the uh, Israeli Egyptian War. President Jimmy Carter. If he didn't do this thing, we still would be seeing more and more border disputes with Egypt and Israel. Worse off than what we've seen right now. But because of the inroads and the inlays, it's not just a Nobel Peace Prize that all three of them got. It's because they made the inroads and constantly tried to build upon those, uh, on the relationships. Is there a possible chance that this makes the America look weak? No. Because if we can be part of a brokering deal, we're brokering peace. But we're dealing with the Palestinian people. We're dealing with what they call the internal war, uh, internal servant, uh, internal matter of the state. But it's not internal. If you look at the wars happening in different countries throughout history, there is never internal. It's always external that we actually have things involved with. Taken point. Revolutionary War, United States. We needed help dealing with great... We, we, we needed help. We needed outside help to supplement our meager weaponry, food, supplies, army, navy, to push back on England and its influence. And we owed France during that time because of that. Civil war was a civil war with the United States. Nobody else was going to get involved in that because it was the North versus the South. But there could have been influences in there if it was allowed, but it wasn't. You have a World War uh, situation happening with uh, World War I and World War II. There were no internal conflicts. This was one country or many countries trying to expand and extend their influence. In the Pacific Theater, when Japan decided to expand their influence into uh, China. 
Japan's a small nation, broken up, but they had a lot of people. Would they have been sufficient enough to conquer and keep a portion of China? But China at, the, at that point didn't have what was necessary to push back. Hence, the American mercenary, uh, mercenaries. Pilots from the U.S. military coming over to help out for money. And Japan was willing, actually, China was willing to pay. But these guys are going to get the combat experiences necessary to go after uh, Japan during that time. The U.S. just kind of frowned upon that kind of action. That's one way of foreign policy right there. Countries influencing others. We're dealing with the Middle East. We're dealing with Israel affecting every country surrounding it. Even in the United States. Even Russia and China. Definitely Saudi Arabia. Uh, most definitely Iran. Lebanon. Egypt. So their internal conflict has brought in a whole nest of countries, not to mention the United Nations involved in an internal civil war. But I also look at the history of Africa and certain uh, countries back then, or even currently to this time, still having warlord issues from one country to another country to another country uh, across that continent. You talk about genocide after genocide happening over there. And it still takes the United Nations, some troops over there, just to put a, if I want to put this in a bit of an analogy over here, a drop of water into a raging fire. If that isn't, uh, if that isn't eye opening right there as it is. But we're dealing with that with the Middle East right now. An eyedropper to deal with a raging forest fire. It's going to take a lot of water to douse it. But then again, there will still be smoldering embers. A lot of smoldering embers ready to flare up. Bide their time. We're not done with this yet.